Hey, Bill, what day is it? Hey, gang. Welcome back to Hey, Bill, what day is it? Have you been feeling kind of old lately? Like there isn't much reason to go on and it seems like life is coming to a close? If that's the case, then you need to learn more about the person whose birthday we celebrate this week. September 7th celebrates the birth of Anna Mary Robertson Moses. You probably know her better as Grandma Moses. Anna Mary Robertson Moses, whose life spanned over 100 years, serves as an inspiration to those who start a career late in life. For most of her life, Anna Moses was known as either Mother Moses or Grandma Moses. She's especially inspirational since Grandma Moses began a career in the arts at an advanced age. You know, my age. Although she didn't begin her artistic career until she was in her mid-70s, she was always a hard-working girl. First, she helped out around the family farm. After the Civil War, many young girls had to leave home and help the family earn a living. So at 12, she went to a neighboring farmer's house and asked if she could work for them. They hired her and she cleaned their house and helped take care of the family. While there, the family noticed that she kept looking at their Courier and Ives prints. They saw something in her and gave her a set of chalks and crayons at Christmas. Long before she would ever make it her career, she displayed a passion for art. When she was 27, she met Thomas Moses and they moved to Virginia. They and their five children later moved to upstate New York and bought a small farm. Between taking care of the family and the farm, she didn't have time for painting, but did enjoy quilting and embroidery to help her relax. She always said, life is what we make it, always has been, always will be. Probably a good attitude for everyone. Even though times got hard, her husband died of a heart attack when he was 67, her farmhouse burned down and the Great Depression hit and she had to move in with one of her daughters due to ill health resulting from having given birth to 10 children, five of which died in infancy. Finally, severe arthritis made it difficult for Anna to pursue her favorite pastime of embroidery. Anna decided she wasn't going to become a victim of self-pity. She came to a point where it was time to decide to take control or give up. Well, giving up just wasn't her style. And one day, her sister suggested she try painting, as that wouldn't hurt her hands as much. She, always, she was always fascinated with painting. So at 77, she gave it a try and started painting as a creative outlet. By the way, when the brush later did get too painful for her to hold in her right hand, she would switch it to her left hand. As a self-taught artist working in rural New York, Moses lacked access to high quality art materials in the early part of her career. Without any small brushes, she often used matches and pins to paint details such as eyes and mouths. Moses painted scenes of rural life from the earlier days, which she called old timey New England landscapes. Moses said that she would get an inspiration and start painting, then I'll forget everything except how things used to be and how to paint it so people will know how we used to live. From her works of art, she omitted features of modern life such as tractors and telephone poles. She never called it art. She said it was a way of teaching people how they used to live, keeping her busy and out of mischief. Grandma Moses displayed her artwork at the local W.D. Thomas Drug Store in Hoosick Fall, New York. Travelers often saw her work and the pastoral scenes depicting small town and country life appealed to many. One day in 1938, an amateur art collector, Louis J. Calder, discovered the immensely beautiful work of Mrs. Moses. He bought everything they had and even went to her house in Eagle Bridge and bought 10 more. He paid $5 each. Later, Mr. Calder convinced the Museum of Modern Art to include Moses in a members-only folk art show. Eventually, Calder's discovery and the Museum of Modern Art opportunity, it led to a one-woman show. Soon, Mrs. Moses found a large global following. While Moses displayed her work under the name Mrs. Moses, 
a reviewer from the New York's Herald Tribune dubbed her Grandma Moses, and it stuck. In 1947, Grandma Moses was featured in True Confessions. Her confession, as noted in the magazine, was, Grandma Moses remains prouder of her preserves than of her painting, and proudest of all of her four children, 11 grandchildren, and four great-grandchildren. Grandma Moses' popularity grew. At one point in the 50s, her exhibitions broke attendance records all over the world. In 1952, Moses published her autobiography, My Life's History, when she was 92 years old. In one chapter, she expressed her distaste for the restrictions placed on her because of her gender. She wrote that many a time I had to rock the cradle. I liked it, but I had rather been outdoors with my brothers. As a part of her 100th birthday celebration, Life magazine featured Grandma Moses on the September 16, 1960 cover. You can tell by the twinkle in her eye that this was a lady who knew how to have a good time and probably stir up a little mischief. In many ways, she reminds me of my mother-in-law. Doreen also painted and had that same mischievous look. Over the years, Grandma Moses received many awards and honors. In 1950, she was cited as one of the five most newsworthy women. In 1951, she was honored as Woman of the Year by the National Association of House Dress Manufacturers. At age 88, Mademoiselle magazine called her Young Woman of the Year. She was also awarded the first honorary doctorate from Philadelphia's Moore College of Art. In 1969, a United States commemorative stamp was issued in her honor by the U.S. Postal Service. In 2006, her painting entitled Sugaring Off, which she painted in 1943, became her highest selling work at $1.2 million. Sugaring Off was a prime example of the simple rural scenes for which she was well known. In many of her winter landscape paintings, Moses sprinkled glitter over the snow. Though some critics called her amateurish for using a non-traditional material, she refused to stop as she thought glitter captured the appearance of snow shimmering in sunlight. Moses' nostalgic depictions of rural America were widely reproduced. Her paintings were licensed by Hallmark, which sold 16 million greeting cards featuring her paintings in 1947 alone. You could also buy fabric and plates printed with images of her paintings, and even a record called the Grandma Moses Suite. Grandma Moses is a person that comes to mind of many people when we think about people starting careers later in life, but she definitely wasn't the only one. There are a great number of people whose best known work was started later in life. Another one most of us know would be Harlan Sanders. After years of failures and restarts, in 1952, Sanders franchised his secret recipe, Kentucky Fried Chicken, for the first time to Pete Harmon of South Salt Lake, Utah, the operator of one of that city's largest restaurants. In the first year of selling the product, restaurant sales more than tripled, with 75% of the increase coming from sales of fried chicken. For Harmon, the addition of fried chicken was his way of differentiating his restaurant from competitors. In Utah, a product hailing from Kentucky was unique and evoked imagery of Southern hospitality. Don Anderson, a sign painter hired by Harmon, coined the name Kentucky Fried Chicken. After Harmon's success, several other restaurant owners franchised the concept and paid Sanders four cents per chicken. And the rest is history. Speaking of history, in the Bible there are many examples of men and women who didn't really do anything great until late in life. Take a look at Abraham and Sarah. God used them to father the nation of Israel well after Sarah had passed her childbearing years. Noah, the builder of the ark, was the son of Lamech, who was 182 years old when Noah was born. Noah fathered three sons and didn't begin building the ark until he was 500 years old. How about Moses, the man who led the Israelites out of Egypt and to the Promised Land? He was 80 when he led them out of Egypt, 
and 120 when he died. Most people don't live that long today, but there was a story on the news this last week about a World War II airborne veteran, Tom Rice. Rice, whose first jump in combat was into the D-Day invasion, decided to celebrate his 100th birthday by parachuting from a World War II C-53 aircraft. He said he was already planning another jump for his 101st birthday. So what makes some people keep on going past 100 years? Many times it's attitude. The people who live that long do it because they don't give up on living. We should do our best to keep ourselves healthy and active. Tom Rice's response to a question about the secret of a long life was, just keep moving. When I was much younger, I got a birthday card from my grandmother. On the front, it said, how to live to be 100. On the inside, it said, get to be 99 and then be very, very careful. Actually, it's all up to God. He has our life planned and knows how long each of us has. I think most of us would live our lives differently if we knew we were going to die tomorrow. What is it that you still have left to do? If you didn't wake up this morning with a chalk outline around your body, you still have time to do it. No matter your age, God still has a plan for your life and things for you to do. So get out there, grab life by the tail, and have a triumphant day.